So this is an interview with Tal Wilkenfeld. She worked with Jeff Beck and Prince, Leonard Cohen, Herbie Hancock, Mick Jagger, Ruth Stewart, Hans Zimmer, Pharrell Williams. It's a very long podcast, one hour, 15 minutes, but there is a section called How to Learn and Practice, which is, of course, very relevant to the discussion we just had. So let's watch it. What would you recommend for young musicians and how to get good? What are the different paths a person can take? Interesting. To understand it deeply enough to create something special. I think first and foremost, understanding why you are playing music. If it's because you have something that you're trying to express or that you're just in love with expression itself, with art itself, those are great reasons um, to to start this journey. The why should be... I think the why clear. is really important because it's a jagged lifestyle. So the question is, of course, like, why do most people start playing? I think the reason is this. Well, there's only two reasons I think I can think of that people start playing. One is because somebody makes them. So it's involuntary. Uh, so your parents maybe or your a teacher in the school makes you play something or, I don't know, a friend <laughs> makes you play something. Like it's involuntary or it's voluntary where you choose to play it. Because, well, the, the reasons could be many, of course. Maybe it's because you want to impress someone <laughs> and you know that they like it. Or you really think the music is beautiful or you're touched by it or you just like the sound of the instrument. I don't really think that's important because it's going to take a while before it is going to become clear to you what it actually takes to get good at it. And then there's always a point where you can stop. So I don't mind if people start playing some something because they think it makes them look cool or anything. Go for it, right? Just, you, you'll, you'll discover soon enough if you are... If a, if a lifestyle, if, if you're young, of practicing is suited uh, to you or not. Of course, if it's involuntary, then then you're probably going to stop. Most people do. And there's a lot in it. And so if you don't have your purpose, if you're not centered in your purpose, then all that that jagged lifestyle is probably going to get to you. Jagged? It's jagged. Word. Yeah, it's jagged. It's It's all over the place. It's uncertain. It's one thing one moment and a completely different thing another moment. You never know what's going to happen. And if you thrive on variety, which I love variety, um, then it's, it's perfect. But also every human being needs a certain amount of certainty and structure. And so it's the certainty can come from your inner knowing, knowing that you're doing exactly what you want to be doing and knowing what your purpose is in, in doing it in this i think nowadays though you, you could do m many things besides just music uh, and still get good right you could get good at, at guitar or whatever it is and then also have a, another job <laughs> um, basically that's what i'm doing right i got quite good at playing guitar and violin but also i'm a youtuber okay it's about guitar and violin but it required me to learn lots of other stuff about cameras and sound and now I'm doing this streaming thing on Twitch and I need to get good at live reaction and articulation. And it's a whole different thing apart from playing. In fact, maybe someday I'll be reacting to something that has nothing to do with jazz guitar, right? So I, I understand what she's saying, but I think nowadays, more than ever, it's really easy to get the good materials to get good. So it's probably going to get good faster because there's less chance that you'd be wasting a lot of time on something that doesn't help you, especially if you meet someone else that can point you to the right resources. And that leaves you time to get good at something else that maybe makes you steady money or something. Like it's, it sounds like she's referring to making a living as a musician, but that is, of course, very difficult. Maybe that's more difficult than it used to be. So I never recommend that to anyone. As, when I get, teach courses at my university about marketing, I always tell them to think about products that don't involve them actively playing. So it could be a book, could be a video course, uh, could be merchandise in some way, right? Maybe you make t-shirts with your band logo. 
okay, you give a concert, but then you also sell the T-shirts. So that does not directly related to you performing in a certain way because people could also buy the T-shirts separately from going to your concert. So the products as a musician is important and not only depends on playing gigs to make money. That's very difficult. As I think it has always been difficult, but maybe now it's even more difficult. Even more difficult if you have a family. Yes, that's also true because then you need to make more money. On the other hand, uh, maybe you're also more motivated to make, to make the money then. Because, of course, if you're a young musician, you don't mind. You take a gig that pays almost nothing because, I know, it's fun. But then if you have a family, then you need to make more money. So maybe you're also more motivated to do it. I don't know. It could also help. It's expression. Otherwise, you're just kind of like a leaf blowing in the wind. Like in the early days, touring, just playing clubs. You know. Not only just more money, but also responsibilities. Hey, but you can always uh, fill your responsibilities with more money. <laughs> no, I'm okay. I know what you mean. Yes, you're right. Uh, that's going to take a lot of time, uh, the responsibilities. So better get good before you get a the family then. Seems like tough. Yeah. It's a lot. Yeah, it's a lot of like the physical labor aspect of it yeah. is really hard. Playing on stage to to two people or 2,000 or 20,000, that doesn't make a difference. I mean, it makes a difference to the ticket sales, which informs how what level actually it does make a difference uh, i find it much easier to play to thousands of people of course i play jazz so it doesn't happen often but i have played for instance with a dj on a big techno festival where fifty thousand people were there now that was not very difficult because what i had to play was very easy but let's say if it's like jazz um i find it much more difficult to play for a few people because in that situation, usually they sit very close to you. They really are on your fingers. And um, you might even have talked to them. <laughs> so you know them. It's more personal. So it gets the, um, the stakes get higher. Uh, when it's thousands of people, it's very impersonal. If it's a big hall and you have lights, you don't see anyone anyway because it's dark. It gets easier. Now, imagine sitting in a in a theater and there's like, uh, maybe there are 1,500 people, right? So that is, for me, would be pretty easy to do because it's very impersonal. But then I look in the first row and right there, it's Herbie Hancock something <laughs> or Birelli Lagrin. Then all of a sudden it gets personal again. And I have the feeling I'm playing for two people if that happens. It even happens sometimes with people I don't know. So I, I'm playing and I look and I see one guy looking very sternly in the front row. This is like this. And then the first thought in my mind is, oh, it's probably also a guitar player and he hates it. <laughs> and it gets personal at that time. And then the only thing I'm trying to do is please, please this guy, of course. And afterwards, maybe I meet this guy and he's just, uh, who works at the local bank, you know. <laughs> so uh, I think the more people there are, the easier it gets for me. So it's not the same experience. I think a few people, it's more difficult. Level of... Uh, luxury you might have on the road or not but other than that it's just people there listening to music the music doesn't change the music doesn't change does it make it tough when it's two people versus 200 no so even if nobody recognizes whatever the thing you're doing no because the the idea is to be doing like having a great conversation on stage hmm. the audience can come and go yeah I mean, I, I always like, at, like there's certain points in shows where I, I'm just like, I consciously am like, oh, yes, there's an audience over there. Because I'm so like wrapped <laughs> wow. up in whatever's happening on stage. You forget yourself. Well, maybe I'm remembering myself. Oh, wow. <gasps> damn. <laughs> Call back somehow. Feels like one. <laughs> okay. That's important, though. It's very important to focus on the people you're playing with. And don't focus on the show that you're giving to the people. I mean, there's a, I think it's a combination because, of course, you don't want to look like you're not enjoying yourself, right? You still want to look like you can have a good time. But you have to actually make yourself have a good time by <laughs> engaging with the people on stage. So sometimes you don't feel like it because maybe you have a headache or, I don't know, you just had a food poisoning or you're tired. But then you just have to fake it until you make it. I was told that in Dutch, by a director once. We were in a band, and then he told us, before you go on stage, because it was very strictly directed, it was the first time 
that we were directed in that way because it was mostly about the singer and it was a whole theater thing. But he told us, like, before you go on stage, you have to smile. You have to smile even if you feel down or bad. I want you to come on stage with a big smile. And this became a thing that was really funny. And even thinking about that we had to smile before we would go on stage because we would be standing there, right? And then we would all smile and we would start laughing and we would actually feel very happy doing that. So but at first we had to fake that smile, but at one point it just became this funny thing that became funnier and funnier and we actually felt very good going on stage. So um, you want to look like you're having a good time and if you don't feel like having a good time, you should just fake having a good time by engaging with a lot of positive energy with the people on stage until you actually are having a good time. And it always works like that for me, at least. Uh, you think every instrument is its own journey? You play guitar, you play bass, you sing. Just the, the mastery of an instrument, or let's avoid the word mastery, the uh, understanding of an instrument is its own thing, or are they somehow like physical manifestations of the same thing? It's both. You know, like every instrument has its strengths, beauty, limitations, range, like possible range that can, you know, be extended to some degree or another, depending on who you are, like trumpet or something, you know, like mm -hmm. certain people can hit higher notes than others, blah, blah, blah. But um, that being said, we're all playing the same 12 or 24, or ho however you divide the octave, that mm -hmm. many notes, mm -hmm. you know, we're all playing the same notes. So in that's nice that she doesn't stop at 12. That's really, I think that's cool. Um, I think if you would have this interview 20 years ago, this might not happen. But now because everybody has gotten into contact, or everybody, most musicians have gotten into contact with music from other cultures, um, there's more of a realization that you don't necessarily need to divide the octave in the 12 equal parts that we do in Western music. There's lots of other ways to do it and produces beautiful, interesting music. In that sense, it's all the same thing. It's just music or better yet, it's just art or expression. Mm -hmm. But yeah, every instrument has, you know, you got to go through the, the physical, the physical aspects of it, the motor skills and all of that. And hopefully you get through that really quickly so you can get to the expression mm -hmm. quickly because... If you get stuck in just that first phase, that's be really boring. Yeah, but that's a, that's, a... that's that's why I say always practice fifteen minutes of technique every day, because you don't want to only be busy with technique. If you only practice technique, and that is your main goal, then the chances are that you'll be a very technical player. But that doesn't guarantee you being a tasteful player. Musical people, some people would say musical. I, I prefer the term tasteful because that really signifies that you understand what sounds good in this, in your chosen style. If you are a tasteful player, that is what it means. Like, oh, this person knows what sounds good on their instrument in this kind of music. Most time needs to be spent on that. And let's say you practice an hour every day, then 50 minutes of technique is very reasonable because again you need technique to play anything so and the techniques need to develop over time but you sp need to spend way more time on uh, becoming a tasteful player the pretty long phase the technical uh, the, the the technical skill required to really play an instrument for some people it's a long thing and some people it's short it very very much varies it might have to do with like how you learn um and getting to know like your strengths in learning, mm -hmm. like more oral or more like, is it more like, kinest like what's what's your strength and playing off of those strengths. So for me, like it was- Okay, what would be the possible strengths? Oral, she says, so that I probably means that, I know I don't know what she means by it, but she could mean, for instance, that you hear music in your head and you're able to play it, which as people that, watch my channel no i i'm not I, i'm it's not something i do myself i also always have doubts uh, of a lot of other people they say that they do it but i could be wrong about that it's just just based on experience i have with lots of different musicians that say they do it and then in practice i can tell that their ears are not capable of doing it 
I can tell that from rehearsal time or like how fast they pick things up. Uh, but that's one strength. Another strength she was talking about, I, she didn't finish the word, but uh, something to do with like how you feel the instrument, like probably mechanical, maybe mechanical. Uh, that is more my way. Uh, that sounds bad, I know. Uh, when I say I'm a mechanical player, that sounds like I'm a robotic player. But I don't think you have to really <laughs> um, do a lot of research to find out that's not true. right? If you if you go to a concert of mine, you'll, you'll see that I'm not a robotic player in that sense that I always play the same way like a robot. With mechanical, I mean that the things I can play are acquired through mechanical practice. And very slowly with a metronome, taking care of details. But when I'm on stage and I play jazz solo, that's not what goes through my head. What goes through my head are the different things I could be playing and what works best at that moment to create a tasteful end result. But the way I got there is through a lot of mechanical practice. So that could be a strength, oral mechanical. Uh, maybe she's going to mention more, but I try to think of something else that could be... A visual? Is that something that maybe that you learned to play from reading a lot of sheet music, like classical players? But there's also a mechanical aspect there. So I'm not sure what else could be strength and play of it. It seems to be, for me, to be divided between then oral inside your head or mechanical. I think the combination would be best. And then if I have to choose between one of them, I would always start someone off with mechanical because that's something I can actually check. I can actually see if you're doing the right movements. If you're practicing with a metronome, that's something I can see and hear. And the oral thing, it's very difficult for me to check it because how am I going to check if you are hearing the right things? Then you need to sing it. A lot of people are not great singers, so it might be out of tune. Uh, you know, maybe your range of your vocal is limited. So I cannot really check if what is in your head is good unless you have the mechanics to also play it. But then again, we get back to mechanical practice like like I was saying earlier, it was just an intuitive thing that I knew I can feel when my brain is full, like mm -hmm. that it needs processing time. And so I listen to that. I don't push past it. Uh, even if it's like one minute and I do something, I'm like, okay, mm -hmm. silence. And then I come back and, it's in a, and I trust that it's going to be there and it is there. Mm -hmm. So just trusting yourself, I think, is really important. Trusting that you know you better than anybody else. is going. So she feels like she's a very intuitive player, like she says. But, so here's the, I, I believe it. I mean, if she feels that way and works, then obviously it, it works. I mean, it ends there. But I can think of a scenario where this wouldn't work anymore. If you go way outside of your style, it's something you don't really understand and you need to learn it quickly because you have a project like next month. Right? Let's say she gets hired to play bass in a, let, let's say in a Turkish music. I always go back to Turkish music, but that's because I have experience with hearing it. So Turkish music, I don't know if maybe she is very experienced in Turkish music, but let's say she's not. And she's hired to do this project. She finds it very interesting. The people that work, to work with are very interesting and uh, you know it's nice locations but her ears just doesn't don't go there how is she going to manage to do that in a month if her ears don't go there there is a chance that she might never get there so then she actually needs to do the mechanical work to make it happen and if it's not with Turkish music it's going to be with something else and this is also what I say to people that only play on the ears. It especially happens with violin players. They take lessons with me, and I don't know, they they play nice. You know, it's it sounds good, good timing, good feeling, uh, good sound, and then. But I hear some some weird things and say, "Okay, what are you thinking on this E flat seven? Why are you playing the line that you just played?" It's like, "Oh well, no, I really don't know the chords. I just play everything by ear." I say, well, okay, that, then you've gotten very good doing that. That's great, because I wouldn't be able to do that, because I'm a very cerebral player in the sense that I'm always aware of what I'm doing. But there will be a limit there, right? Let's say you manage to, to play that E flat 7 the next time you do it. But there will be a limit to what, you can, what your ears can reach. 
once we get to Coltrane changes, I'm just giving an example. Maybe you don't hear it and you never meant to hear it. So you can make the choice there to never, just never play on it. Or maybe you really want to. But now, to understand that, you need to do a lot of cerebral work. But because you haven't done the basis for that, there's no way you can do that. So then the first you need to do all of the preliminary work and just learn basic harmony and learn the chords to simple tunes and then understand what you're doing already intuitively. That's going to take a very long time, such a long time that you will never get to the thing that you actually want to learn. It's like these sounds that you hear that you want to play, but you can only get it by working on it mechanically and cerebral, cerebrally, cerebrally <laughs> with your brain. But in able to do that work, you need to understand the basis that you were already good at intuitively. And that's a problem I encounter a lot with violin players, ear players. A lot of violin players are ear players. So when I start talking about 251 or turnarounds, they, their brain shuts off and uh, they, they're not interested anymore. But the question they had for me and what they want to have explained, I can only explain in those terms. So that's where the ears stop. Now, some people probably have maybe unlimited ears. Maybe, maybe she could be one of them, of those people, that can hear everything. And I know people like that. Well, I know one guy like that. Um, so they might never have that problem. But I think for most people, this limit is reached so sooner rather than later. So I think it's always good to combine what you can hear with something mechanical and cerebral. Just to make sure that if you reach your, your, the end of the road for you, that you can actually go past that hurdle by doing more work with your brain before you can hear it. I'm going to know you. So that's the kind of thing with, with teachers that can be either really, really helpful and great or really not great. Like I'm primarily self-taught. I've had amazing mentors of all walks of life, and I think I'm unbelievably blessed that my mentors are some of my favorite musicians on earth, whether it's Leonard Cohen or Jeff Beck or Wayne Shorter, whoever these people are, like they are my favorite musicians. So not everyone has that opportunity, but what the opportunity that we have now that I didn't have when I was starting is that everything's on YouTube. Mm -hmm. Like every interview with every genius, like you... you so that's funny because she's self-taught. I'm also self-taught in what I do now. I play gypsy jazz guitar. I never had any guitar lessons. I never had any jazz lessons with guitar. Um, of course, I had a very good education for, for classical violin. Uh, also, I also had jazz violin lessons, but I can truthfully say I never used anything <laughs> that I learned there to actually play jazz violin. Because when I started learning jazz, it was after I got into contact with uh, the Sinti musicians, Stochla Rosenberg, that whole family. And they are mostly mechanical players in the sense that they have a lot of emphasis on technique and how to play stuff. They're also very musical in the sense that they know what is tasteful, what sounds good. But that's when I really started learning playing, when I started focusing on the same things they were focusing on. But it's also self-taught, but it's with a... I'm self-taught with this cerebral part always engaged, like, okay, what am I doing here? Oh, this is the chord, it's E7, okay. Same like Stochler, right? He wouldn't say the name, because he doesn't know the name, but he would think, oh, this shape, on this shape, I can play this. So that means if I move the shape down, I can do this. This was always engaged. And that means that if there's a concept that is outside of what I can understand immediately, just by hearing it, I can just think through it, build on knowledge that I have already. Like, let's say somebody shows me this, same shape, somebody says, somebody shows me this. I can actually, based on what I already knew, I can explain it because I was playing B flat seven here on E seven. This is F minor, and F minor is the two chords for B flat seven. That's why it works on E7, right? So that's how I would be thinking. And that enables me to then use this concept with a lot more chances of success because I can both play it mechanically and think about it. And now I'm saying that everybody should do it, but uh, it's a safe way to always make sure that you can progress to the next level. 
she might not need that because she can hear everything, but there's not many people that actually can hear everything. You don't need to necessarily have these people in person now. I mean, it, and, and then I'll say to that, yes and no. <laughs> I, I agree with myself and then I don't agree with myself. Mm -hmm. and, and the reason is I do believe that there is something that happens when you're in person with a master um, True. in some cases that there is something transferred that is not intellectual, it's not spoken, it's something else that happens, mm -hmm. that can happen, and that I've experienced. And um, I really value that. And I think that applies to specific... This is 100% correct. And that is something I would wish everyone... <laughs> Uh, but it is possible to, to have it, I will, I will tell you later. But I remember making the rhythm guitar course with Nusha Rosenberg, probably the greatest rhythm guitar player uh, currently in life. In my opinion, he is. But surely in the top three, I think everybody would agree with that. It's just uh, his sense of rhythm, but also the sound and just the way he approaches the whole thing. I made this crowdfunding campaign to produce a course with him. And there was no course, but he didn't have any uh, course, video course. There were lots of other stuff already on the market, but he didn't have any. The, re the reason for that is, of course, that he's a completely self-taught player, like most Sinti, but he was also very shy about it. He would be very shy to just sit across from you, at that time at least, and show you how he plays, right? Because he would be afraid of you asking him questions that he couldn't answer. So I really had to convince him. And I said, man, don't worry about that. I'll take the, the teaching part. Uh, I'll write everything down that you do, and I'll explain it uh, just written down. You only have to play. So we did a crowdfunding campaign. It was very successful. We got funded, and I spent dozens of hours in a very small studio with him recording that course. This was back when there were not great cameras available for a cheap price, so it was all very difficult to do. But just sitting in that room with him, Seeing him play all the time, like very close to me, because I was sitting in the same room. I, I didn't go into the control room with the glass. I was sitting in the same room, so I could give him direct instructions, and I could ask anything from him. Say, play this song. Or, Can you play it slower? Can you play it faster? Can you do this embellishment? And just seeing him across from me, hearing that sound, seeing the motions, I was filming with two cameras. I learned something about rhythm guitar that I couldn't have learned any other way, I think. And now when people hear me play rhythm, most people really like it. And even though it's not like Nusha, uh, precisely, I, I'm not a copy of him, it is completely based on his way of playing. I adapted it a little to make it more accessible for, uh, for others because he, the way he plays can be very complicated. So I made it more accessible so I could teach it. But it's completely based on that experience. I don't think there's any other way I could have developed my own rhythm style if I wouldn't have been in that room with him for, I don't know, like, I think we spent two months shooting every day, something like that. Same with Stochola Rosenberg, uh, the solo guitar player. I spent literally hundreds of hours in the, in the same studio recording stuff for the Rosenberg Academy. And even though my technique is completely different, uh, well, no, it's not different. It's actually the same, but the choices I make for the picking patterns are different. It is completely based, the sound, uh, the vibrato, um, the choices I make for what to play, it's completely based on th that experience. On top of that, of course, a lot of practice, and now I have many other influences, but I don't think I could have reached the level I am now, whether that's good or not, that's <laughs> it's not up to me, but I couldn't have reach that level if I wouldn't have had that experience. Now, other people might say, well, that's not very fair because we cannot ha never have that experience. Now, but you can. Because there are several uh, Sinti camps uh, that are organized. One is next month, February 20th, and there will be Stochler Rosenberg teaching, um, Paul Schaefer, and me. And we'll be teaching there. So you can actually get that experience. You can already get that experience by just uh, being with me in one room and then I'll show you what I learned from those grandmasters. I'm, I'm capable of explaining it very well.
because of the Rosenberg Academy, where I did all that work and the, and the YouTube channel, I had to think a lot about how to teach this stuff. So it is possible to get these experiences one-on-one. -on -one. There's also the, the Paulus Schaefer camp in, in the summer. There is uh, the festival in the UK in October, where also um, a lot of these people teach. I teach there every year. There's, there's several of these opportunities. Robin Nolan, of course, is teaching those camps. So it is actually possible to get these experiences. And everybody that went to a camp like that, it, it, life is changed when it comes to music because there is something there that you learn that you will never learn just by watching a video. I had the same experience after hearing Benji Winterstein and Hono Winterstein playing rhythm right next to me. It is not something that translates well through video. You have to hear and feel it in person. Yes, you have. Even better if you can ask questions. Not, not uh, like technical, like, okay, uh, are you playing triplets? No, but more like, oh, could you play, could you, could you guys maybe play this other tune? Because then it will answer something uh, very direct that you have questions about. Of course, you cannot do that if you just sit next to Benji Winterstein. But I was able to do it when I was in that room with Nusha because we were producing a course. Specific disciplines and also generally, like I've been around Olympic gold medalists just to hang out with them for several days. And there's something, there's something about greatness. There's a way about them that kind of uh, permeates the space around them. You kind of learn something from it, yeah. even if you don't practice that particular discipline. Yeah, there's something to it if you're if you're able to see it. I also like what you said about the playing stuff in your head. That it forces you to not be. Um, lost in the in the physical learning of the instrument. I think that's one of the things I probably regret a little bit. So I, I play both piano and guitar and I've become quite over the years technically proficient at the I've instruments, seen. but I think my mind is underdeveloped because of that. Meaning like I can't really like, um, I can feel so I move my camera to the bottom left because I think that's a little bit nicer to Lex Friedman because <laughs> I was over his head all the time. So sorry that I was late with that. I can feel the music when it's created, but I can't create out of the feeling. I haven't... Trying to... It seems also like he has trouble verbalizing exactly what he means. I'm also not sure that he knows what he's talking about. He, is, he became technically proficient, but he feels like something is lacking here but what is it exactly i should hear and play but let's, let's continue and practice the uh project oh, yeah. projecting the feeling onto the music you know mm. what I mean? i'm not like a musician but i'm just it, it's it's a different that sounds to me like he's saying that he sounds too mechanical um i don't think that's anything wrong with that if you sound mechanical but good like good timing um everything you play makes sense, harmonically, rhythmically, that is a very good basis to start working on, let, let's say, playing with feeling, but I would more equate that to being a tasteful player or crea creative. That's also part of being tasteful. Um, that's a good basis. I think it's better that way for me, personally, in my philosophy on music than the other way around. Like somebody that is already very creative on the beginning, but doesn't have the technical skills to make things sound good on the instrument because it's just weak technique, uh, sloppy. Now, it is possible to be a good player without great technique, don't get me wrong, but there needs to be a certain level of technique to match what it is that you want to bring. It shouldn't be that your, your technique is limiting the ideas that you want to play. If you, if you have a great affinity or a love for triplet lines, <laughs> triplet phrases, then you should work on your technique to make sure that you can play that. It shouldn't be like, okay, well, I can actually not play triplets, so I won't do it, even though I really, it feels like I should be doing that. So I think your technique should always be in development. So now he's saying, okay, I can play with feeling. I'm not sure what he means, but if he means that He's not playing things that he would like to hear himself 
when he would listen to himself or he listened to another player and think, ah, I wish I could play something like that. Then I think the, the obvious solution would be to transcribe more of that player that is playing like that, figure out what it is that makes it sound so great and then try to apply that. I think that would be the obvious solution. solution. Muscle, that I think is, if you really want to create beautiful things, you have to, the creation happens here, not with I your think hands. it's more here. Or whatever, whichever. It's some part of the body, but it's not with your fingers. Yeah, because I think the fingers is more this. Sure. And then... Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I think I understand what they're saying. It sounds a little bit vague, vague to me. If I would describe this in with more precision, at least I think so, is the fingers is, a te is the technical aspect of it. So can you move your fingers to the speed and to the right places on your instrument to produce the notes that you want to play. That's a technical thing. But then uh, playing with feeling or being a tasteful player, that's a also a decision that happens here, I think. I mean, I don't know for sure what happens here. I don't think anything happens here physically, uh, except maybe for maybe like feeling the beat, right, with your body. But it doesn't have anything to do with the notes that you play. Uh, decisions about what it is that you should play next to make sense or to create a story or create a coherency or create excitement or any emotion that you want to evoke. I think it's still here. It's decisions. It's listening to yourself, listening to the other people around you and see what the music needs from you at that point to create the best possible thing at that moment. Might, it might be that you shouldn't play anything. I had a teacher once. Uh, I studied jazz on violin on the on university. I had a great teacher, but in the end, the things he taught me were not things that I actually use because this was before I met Stocholo. I didn't graduate uh, that that subject also uh, with this teacher. But he said uh, he was a great teacher. He had a lot of knowledge. Uh, I learned a lot of good things from him about theory. But he said one thing. I, w I was playing a tune, had some difficult chords. And I was playing some crappy things on those chords. And he said, you know, you don't have to play anything there. But I said, yeah, but I, I want to be able to play there. He says, but yes, but listen, if you play in a band and the rhythm section sounds great, do you think that place would sound better if you play like that on it? Or does the rhythm section sound great on its own when you don't play? It's like sometimes it's better to have to let the rhythm section play those difficult things and make sure that it sounds great. And of course, you need to practice the difficult things. But he made a point like, when you go have a gig or something and you're not ready to play on, on that particular chord, then, then leave it to the rhythm section and make the let the rhythm section sound good for you. So... Uh, I'm not sure <laughs> why I was saying this, but I think it was relevant to what was said here. But uh, funny story anyway. Yes, yeah. <laughs> it is here. Yeah. Right. And it's just nice that you said that because it, it, um, it's probably really, it's really good advice if you want to create. Yeah, slowing down is really great too. What do you mean slowing down? Slowing everything down. It could be, you know, I can play something really fast, but I may want to like, Practice it. Yeah. Like. Go slow as possible. Because there's all these micro movements and uh, that are happening that if you just go, like, you you can't pay as close attention. This reminds me of Hal Gelper, a great jazz educator. Um, he has this thing where he makes piano players play a note and then listen for the resonance of the note. And then I think it has something to do with uh, the way you press the keys and then also with the timing. Uh, but... He makes it a point to not only think of a, of a middle C as middle C, but actually play it and listen for what happens in the sound to give you more information to use. 
I think that's the same, more or less the same board that she's making here. Uh, it's very interesting. I've never really thought about it that way, but I, I could see the value there. Maybe I should, I should do that more. Attention to the exact tone that you're pulling from each note. And there's a lot to pay attention to, to how my fingers are touching the string here. Mm -hmm. Like I can change my tone a million ways just by the direction of this finger. Mm -hmm. And same with how this lands and how hard I'm attacking the string. And with what intention am I hitting the string? Emotionally, mm -hmm. physically. And so even if you can go blah, 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 blah play that so slow. See how locked into a pocket you can be. See how you like feel every aspect of that. Cause then when it gets sped up, it's still there with you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's brilliant. It's kind of like. I think that's, um, of course, a very um, significant thing she just said. And I agree with it. I would also add the metronome there. Maybe she doesn't agree with that, but uh, I like to practice very slowly with a metronome, especially when it's something new. And just like you said, for the pocket, and to see how much I can play with the timing to and uh, and still make it sound good. Uh, to I can play with accents, target notes, and work on consistency. Like, can I make my swing rhythm very consistent across uh, four bars in any tempo? That's super important. And there's only one way to do it, and that's to play very slowly and listen to every note you're playing. So I don't really do it to listen for the quality of every note. I think she was making that point before, but I do it more for timing purposes and for, um, yeah, to get rid also to, of any sloppy sloppiness that would be there. Like maybe I mute some strings with my left hand or I miss strings with my right hand. If you slow something down, you can really focus on every movement, like just like she was saying. I think a lot of musicians skip that practice, especially amateur musicians. I noticed that when I teach at camps, I teach something and the only thing I hear them practice, practice is everything super fast without the metronome. You should be, be practicing everything very slowly with the metronome and only speed it up once you are comfortable with it in a slower tempo. Like the transcended and included thing that mm -hmm. Ken Wilber mm -hmm. talks about, like, it's like, and I guess that's what meditation can do for you is to like really listen to your, like observe every aspect of your body, the breath and all this. Here you're observing every element, like every super detailed element of playing a single note. Yeah. That's cool that if you speed it up, it's still there with you. It oh, is. but let me add that. There's one important thing. If you want to play fast, you also need to practice fast. So only practicing slow. I'm getting kind of the feeling here that that they're saying, or at least Lex was saying like, oh, so, but then when you speed it up, it's still there. Uh, to a certain extent, yes, maybe to a certain beats per minute, like uh, you're practicing everything at 40, which is very slowly. Like 40 be beats per minute would be this. Right? Maybe you're practicing something like that. You're practicing, um, you're practicing this. So I'm trying to work on making that very straight. I noticed that this C was, uh, I missed it once. And I can see when I speed this up to 160, I can still see myself doing it. But I know I have a limit there, and the limit is probably 190. I'm already struggling. So let's, if I put this metronome at 210, there's no way I can get it. Right? It's kind of fake. I'm losing control. I'm losing consistency. And I just know that practicing more at 40 will never get me. I actually have to practice this at 210 for a long time. And the way to do it is to start at two, to go the other way. 
So start at 250 and do the best you can. Uh, I will for fun, I will show you what I mean. So you start at 250 and you just do the best you can for like one minute. There's no way I can do it, right? There's no way. And then you slow it down, you go to 240. I'm already getting tired. Because you have to do a little longer, and you go to 220, and you go to 210. And you repeat it a couple of times, and you will notice at one point the 210 will feel so much um, better to you than before because you are doing it at 250. You have to do it for like, try that for five minutes, take some breaks, really make yourself struggle, and then go slower. Do that, I always say, do that once a week. So every day you practice slowly to get it um, very precise. But then once a week, you start with the metronome on the other end and you work your way down. And I promise you, if you do that with things that you want to be able to play fast, not only just single phrases, but also improvisation. Let's say you want to get good at improvising on Donnelly. And um, it's usually played at like 270, 280. And your limit is 240. Yeah, practice it at 170, 180. But once a week, start your metronome at 310. <laughs> and play two choruses, and then go to 300, until 280. And you do it once a week for a half year, I will promise you that will do wonders for your ability to play fast. So yes, practice slow most of the time, but also practice fast, uh, let's say one eighth of the time that you were practicing uh, that particular thing, seven eighths of it's gonna be slow, one eighth is gonna be super fast. Yes, I've, I've yeah, it is. Because I hear p there are certain people, it's like they play really fast, but I don't hear fullness of tone always. And it's like, well, it's probably because maybe they didn't, maybe it's because they didn't slow it down and really sit with each note and let it like resonate through their whole being. Mm -hmm. It's spiritual. It's like a spiritual expression. It's not just like, you know, it's not, it's not a sport. A lot of people treat music like a sport. Yeah, since starting to learn more. Well, it's, it's actually, in fact, it is a sport in some instances. Uh, if you go to a classical music competition or a jazz competition, it is actually a sport in that moment. Doesn't mean that's always a sport, but sometimes it is, and sometimes you need that push probably to get better in a short amount of time. Uh, I'm not saying everybody should do that, but sometimes it is actually a sport, and great talents have come from the sport aspect of it. Uh, I mean, Pasquale Grasso, one of the greatest jazz guitar players alive right now, won the West Montgomery competition. That's how I learned of him. I think many people learned of him through that competition. He's a great artist. He's not a, 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 an athlete, but it was through the sporting event that he had to prepare for and had to make sure that uh, he was ready for it, uh, that I got to know him. Like Steve Ray Vaughan versus Jimi Hendrix. I, I would spend a, quite a long time on single notes of just bending, just like, just listening to what you can do with bends, spending. Just thinking like people like B.B. King and all these blues musicians like spend a career just making a, a single note cry. Yeah. There's like an art form to that. Yeah. And I, I think you putting it like, taking it really slow, which I never really thought of, is a really good idea. Like really slow it down. It's the same with like sitting with your own emotions. It's like we, when emotions are overwhelming to us, we get real busy or we move real fast because it's like we don't want to feel our feelings. Mm -hmm. And it, those are the moments to slow yourself down and observe it anger, jealousy. And just be loneliness. with it. Yeah, just be with it. Be like, be cool with it. Like, love it. Love yeah. the yeah. anger. It's all beautiful. <laughs> Maybe I never get angry, uh, but I do get frustrated sometimes practicing because it's not working. But I always say embrace the frustration because that just means that you are uh, trying to get better. Can you educate me on the difference between bass? Bass and bass? Okay, okay. well, one is a fish. Here's why I'm going to end it because now we get slap versus finger style, which I really want to see. But uh, for the purposes of my channel, I think this was the most interesting part about the learning aspect, practicing aspect. I think there was a great video. I mean, uh, probably one of the 
the top tenors of uh, on YouTube anyway at 3.5 million subscribers. So I would wouldn't expect any less from Lex Friedman. Have a great interview. She had great insights. It was really great to see. Um, so <laughs> normally I'd say check out the uh, channel uh, subscribe, but I don't think Lex Friedman needs me or Tal Wickenfeld needs me to tell you to go to that channel. I mean, my channel is nothing compared to it. But still, it was really nice to react to. Mm-hmm.